So today I'll basically be speaking about conservation of wildlife. Is is it's not a standalone discipline. It it actually amalgamates several uh, disciplines of science, and one of uh, such uh, disciplines is genetics. So there has been extensive application of genetics and tools and techniques offered by genetics in conservation of wildlife. At Arinak, we have been using genetic for conservation of wildlife for past almost 12 years since we have started with our own uh, in-house uh, wildlife genetics laboratory in 2008. So I'll basically be talking about certain basic things about how genetics is used for you know, uh, wildlife conservation, as well as certain scopes and certain limitations. You know uh, this, and and this is a, a diverse uh, audience. Some of you are professors in biology, so I mean, this will be too basic, uh, basically talk for them. And and then I also realize that some of you are not from biology background itself. So uh, it will be kind of a mixed presentation for everyone, not going too deep into, deep into the technical things, but then not uh, skipping uh, some of the basics as well. So genetics as, uh, as a conventional definition today, it's basically, you know, study of genes, how uh, they are inherited from one generation to the other, and the variations, uh, across different organisms or uh, different individuals or species, basically at, at different levels of uh, taxonomic hierarchy. And then how this genetic variation basically leads to evolution. So that, that is another you know, important aspect of uh, studying genetics. When you talk about genetics in utilization of uh, you know, genetics uh, for conservation, it essentially forms a self standalone discipline uh, as we term as conservation genetics. Now it's kind of an, you know, a combination of genetics plus conservation biology. And as you know, basically in general, conservation biology is a study of, you know, species and populations. And particularly, you know, those who are impacted by, you know, various human influences, as well as, you know, environmental uh, factors. Uh, so, and how, how to find, you know, a maintain, uh, a, you know, way to maintain and restore biodiversity in the midst of such influences. And the genetics, particularly conservation genetics, it's basically the application of genetics to preserve its species as a dynamic entity so that it, it's capable of coping with uh, various environmental as well as other, uh, you know, uh, changes. Now, when you talk about biological conservation, first, when you talk about biodiversity, you probably already know it exists as, or it is defined at three levels. One is genetic diversity, then species diversity, and diversity as ecosystem, ecology, ecological level. Now, biological conservation is all about maintaining this diversity of living organisms at these three different levels. You know, not only to, uh, you know, uh, protect the organisms or to keep them alive, but also to maintain their habitat and the interrelationship between different organisms or, or uh, since their ecology. Uh, so the underlying problems in conservation, when you are, you know, you know, try to achieve uh, uh, success in conservation, the main challenges are the population sizes are reducing, Habitat is getting, you know, uh, is shrinking day by day, as well as they are getting fragment. They're losing connectivity, basically, between uh, populations, between uh, different uh, patches of habitat. And then, of course, there are other challenges like, uh, you know, crime, like poaching and all those things. And in overall, there are various factors that can lead to, you know, uh, extinction of a species uh, due to different pressure, whether natural or, uh, you know, anthropogenic. Now, power of conservation genetics, uh, you know, comes from some of the tools uh, that allows us certain things like we can quantify what is the uh, level of genetic diversity at different levels, starting from individual level to a population or a species level or to a landscape level. And then it allows us to uh, accurately estimate population size of a, uh, of a species. And then... <laughs> Uh, how the genetic changes are occurring uh, across time as well as space. So not only across a particular landscape or, or where the species is found, but also historically. Uh, 
And then it also helps identifying, you know, unique evolutionary relations or uh, lineages, uh, like which are the populations who, which have greater potential evolution or, uh, you know, wh which can act as a source populations, all those things. So those kind of things uh, can be identified through genetic uh, conservation genetics. And then it, it also helps us, uh, you know, monitoring uh, exchange of individuals from uh, one population to the other, whether uh, there is dispersal occurring or th these are close populations, all those things uh, can be monitored. And of course, there are tools uh, available, <clears throat> particularly, you know, DNA-based tools, which uh, are used for crime mitigation, like, uh, you know, uh, forensic analysis. Now, if ultimately, the goal of conservation genetics is to offer management recommendations for uh, conservation. Now, this is a very basic thing. I, I even don't think I need to explain this, but for those non-biology participants, uh, you also probably have heard the DNA. This is, this is, a, this is a staple term now. Uh, this is nothing uh, alien or nothing too scientific about it. We know that inside our cells, we have DNA, which carries the blueprint of life how uh, I am like my father, how my uh, daughters looks like me. It's basically passed on from one generation to the other through this blueprint of life called DNA. And it's nothing but, you know, uh, basically these four <coughs> molecules or four nucleotide bases, A, T, G, C, and how they are arranged in a sequence of millions of, um, uh, mil of millions of such bases. Uh, basically determines what basically DNA codes for or how uh, one DNA sequence of or DNA sequence of one individual or one species uh, varies from one to other. So th th this is basically the fundamental of all the variations that we see across uh, different levels of uh, hierarchy. Now there's a few terms terms that uh, you know uh, everyone needs to understand. Now G, I mean, these are very generalized descriptions. There can be very complex descriptions, but say for example, you have heard of the term gene. Now gene is nothing but a specific sequence of DNA. Forget about uh, you know what it does, what it doesn't. But ideally, it it is located at a particular you know location. Uh, its location on the chromosomes is known, and also it's uh, it's uh, believed to be a functional unit of inheritance you know it may code for something it may not code for something you know it may lead to a protein synthesis it may not it may have other functions but ultimately it's a functional unit and then alleles are nothing but variant uh, you know forms of a gene uh, now like gene may have different you know uh, uh, you know a variety of copies in, in a particular population now again uh, in actual term, you know, allele can be actually the variant forms in a particular location, irrespective of whether it's a gene or not. But then for, for the ease of understanding, we'll, we'll just, uh, you know, discuss as if alleles are different variant forms of a gene. Now, for example, uh, in this particular diagram, you can see that we, we have uh, two variant forms uh, arranged um, in, in the chromosomes at a particular location. So accordingly, we may have four uh, different combinations, or rather to say, uh, three different combinations. Uh, now, you may have two double A's, we may have, uh, sorry, one double A, we may have two big A, small A, and two small A's. So basically, th these are called genotypes, how the alleles are basically arranged. and Considering the fact that we have one chromosome coming from mother, one from uh, one from mother, one from father, so we may either have uh, two different types of allele at a particular location or a single uh, you know type of allele at a particular location, and that would uh, that would you know uh, determine what type of a uh, you know uh, genotype we have, whether we have a you know, genotype that has two different kinds of allele or whether we have a genotype that has the same kind of allele. And that particular location is basically known as a locus and in plural it is known as loci. Now, the, the, this, these terms basically I'll be using when I, when I uh, you know, the, the, uh, discuss about the uh, rest of the things. So that's why these are important for you, particularly the non-biology people to understand. 
Now, the fundamental discussion in conservation genetics starts with, you know, discussing about genetic diversity. Now, when you talk about genetic diversity, it's basically diversity of their, you know, genome content. It may be at different level. It may be at gene level. It, it may be at, you know, a chromosome level. But then we basically talk about a species pool of uh, genetic uh, diversity. It may cross, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it may exist at three level. It may exist within an individual, like, uh, you know, we talked about here, like, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, when we have two different uh, kinds of alleles at a particular location, that that, that is known as, a, you know, a heterozygote, uh, for example, uh, locus. Now, uh, so heterozygote locus, that means it has two alleles. So it is more diverse than having the same allele at a particular location. So we may have, depending on whether a particular locus is heterozygote or homozygote, we may have a diversity within a particular individual. Now, that uh, diversity can span across different individuals of a population or across different populations also. So we, we may need to study uh, genetic diversity at these three different levels when we talk about, you know, uh, you know, for example, estimating genetic diversity of a species. Now, why should we be concerned with genetic diversity? Uh, why, why it's important to uh, understand what is the level of genetic diversity of a particular species, particularly those uh, threatened species. Now, it is, un, you know, accepted widely that you know, the di genetic diversity uh, gives us the ability to withstand stress and challenges. Now, these stress and challenges can be a variety of things, like it can be natural uh, stress, like, uh, you know, different environmental factors. It can be certain, uh, you know, uh, disease aspects, like some populations may be more uh, susceptible to certain uh, diseases than others. Take the example of Corona. <laughs> Uh, I suppose you have already observed how some of the countries are more affected. Of course, uh, keeping aside the other administrative part, so there are possibilities that some of the populations are more adapted to, you know, such uh, traits. So that um, adaptation reflects that we have diversity among different populations. So that's how we we directly relate population health to such adaptive variations, which is, you know, conferred by uh, the amount of genetic diversity a species has. Now, again, uh, it is also important to maintain the evolutionary potential of a particular species, and that is again conferred by the amount of genetic diversity available. So, a diverse, uh, even a, you know, a species having greater genetic diversity has greater potential of, uh, you know, evolution, which will allow it to, you know, um, survive for longer generations. Uh, and then genetic diversity is also, it's of course, one of the primary levels of biodiversity, as we've mentioned. So several conservation challenges can benefit from such genetic data. Now, uh, how we measure genetic diversity, I'm not going to discuss much. So we basically measure in, in terms of how many alleles are there, how these alleles are combined, I mean, you know, what proportion of these alleles. So it, it is the number of alleles as well as their frequency in a particular population that, that is measured basically uh, in, in order to understand the level of genetic diversity. Now, why genetic diversity is important, particularly for threatened species? It's because of, uh, because we know about the fact that, you know, uh, smaller populations are more vulnerable to changes in genetic diversity. Now, this is a particular graph. You don't you don't need to you know read much through, but you can just uh, you know this is the percentage of genetic variance remaining. Uh, this axis says, and uh, this axis says the number of generations. So if you see, and this n is basically the population size. You don't need to go about the exact uh, terminology. So if you see which increasing population size from n 1 2 3 5 10 to 1000 there is a greater possibility of retaining the genetic variance across different generations so this is a matter of 10 generation if we start with a smaller population size that means will be uh, that there is a greater chance of losing the uh, variance compared to if we start with a 
larger population size. So that's why for smaller populations, uh, you know, the genetic diversity, uh, having a certain amount of genetic diversity even matter most for their survival. Now there are certain things called, say for example, founder effect. Uh, I, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to discuss much detail about these things, but this is basically how, you know, in smaller populations, they are more susceptible to reduction in genetic diversity or change in allele frequency. So for example, uh, if, if this col dif different colors means different types of, you know, alleles, then if you see that if, if, say, for example, from the parent population, a small, uh, you know, satellite population is created, and eventually, you know, uh, due to several factors, stochastic factors, like random factors, we may end up, you know, uh, losing one of the, say, aliens or one of the variants, and eventually the population may get fixed. So this is, this is what is known as founder effect. So starting with a smaller uh, population or some or a number of individuals. The second thing is that if the population size reduces suddenly for a certain period of time or certain generations, so that uh, so the surviving population uh, due to uh, various factors, uh, which I'm not going to discuss much now, uh, we may have, you know, find a different frequency of the alleles or different frequency of the variants in the new uh, population. So this may also have certain, um, uh, you know, effects. For example, what if the frequency of a deleterious gene or, dele or, a, or a gene which, which is, you know, which causes a particular gene increases in the population. So those kind of things may happen. Now, how to ensure, you know, survival of small populations? Basically, through identification of evolutionary significant units, uh, proper estimation of genetic diversity, you know, robust estimates of population size and sex ratio, all these things can be done using genetic data. And how the diversity is distributed across space, how the diversity has changed across different gener uh, generations. Now, this is a power of genetics that even without, uh, you know, doing historical sampling, we can actually, you know, infer things about how historically the population has changed in terms of genetic diversity as well as their population size. And then, of course, we can also monitor genetic exchange between populations. And of course, uh, the ultimate goal would be to uh, recommend population management. Now, there are various tools and techniques offered by genetics. I'm not going to discuss about you may have heard of certain terms like DNA sequencing, you know, PCR. Now, in, in this corona analysis thing, you must have heard the term RT-PCR. So all these different techniques are used for various applications. Now, <laughs> The fundamental of understanding how DNA is used is to know that there are some things called genetic markers or DNA markers. These are again basically certain fragments of DNA having a known location of you know chromosome. And they carry variation across different individuals or across different populations. Uh, so some of them are basically sequence based. As you know, DNA has sequence of these four bases. So if you consider these four samples, we may have like you know. Uh, variation is at some of their some of the positions, uh, but some other. Uh, for example, this initial uh, tree position doesn't have any variation across the samples, and then we may have variation at some other uh, sites, basically, and those are called as polymorphic sites. So, a sequence having such polymorphic sites can be of use as a genetic marker or a DNA marker. Now, there are certain other DNA markers which directly doesn't, uh, you know, look into the sequence variation, but rather, but rather look at, look at <clears throat> how many number of <clears throat> repetitive DNA is available. For example, here is a repeat of CAT, 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 basically. So if you look at two samples, now uh, in sample one, we have five repeat of cat and sample two, we have seven repeat of cat. So basically, this is the variation in terms of their size. And these size-based markers are of particular use in <coughs> detecting individual to individual variation or variation at a smaller time scale in population level. And this is known as uh, microsatellite genotyping. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into detail of microsatellite genotyping, uh, but then it, this, is, this is very useful for uh, in, uh, you know, detecting one individual from another. Uh, and this is what is known basically as uh, the popular term DNA fingerprinting. So microsatellite genotyping basically offers us a tool of DNA fingerprinting. 
Now we can generate such microsatellite genotype data from populations and you know look at say for example this is these are 15 samples and we can find out uh, using say uh, eight uh, microsatellite markers we can find out how many say individuals are there in these samples this is a real data set actually from on our uh, tiger work so this is a close up view of uh, such uh, change uh, you know uh, size variations now I'll, I'll come to some of the conservation genetic case studies by, uh, carried out by Wildlife Genetics Laboratory of Aranda, which was established in 2008. It's, it's, uh, it's basically the only uh, dedicated wildlife genetics laboratory in Northeast India and the only, only genetic laboratory at NGO level in India as far as uh, my knowledge goes. So we have various facilities. Uh, uh, you can also visit our website to know more about our work. But then, uh, we, we, I mean, we are, uh, I, I would like to mention some of the major activities, like we are, you know, a recognized facility for wildlife DNA forensic analysis in Assam. Uh, we have been doing genetic monitoring of greater 100 rhinos in India. We, we were involved in population genetic monitoring of other Asian rhino species in Indonesia. Uh, we have been continuously monitoring tiger and other carnivores in uh, Eastern India across different tiger reserves. We have been doing molecular tracking of conflict elephants in Assam. Uh, then we, we were also involved in like work. Uh, we, we, we in fact pioneered this work, uh, you know, um, genetic studies on critically endangered white-bellied heron in Bhutan. We uh, conducted like genetic monitoring studies of snow leopards in uh, Wangsuk Sentinel Park in Bhutan. And then we are also studying the primate phylogenies, some of the primate phylogenies in Northeast India. Now all these blue uh, things are basically Things that those are which are ongoing, basically. Now, <clears throat> how we do how we do genetic studies at population level is that we take samples because you know for for genetic studies we need DNA and for DNA we need samples from those uh, spe species, those individuals. So non-invasive samples are those which can be collected without capturing or handling an animal, like you know feces, hair, feather, all these kind of things. So there are advantages of basically non-invasive sampling and basically we are, for example, extensively use feces of different species to study their populations. Uh, like, you know, for this example, like, you know, we, 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 we uh, for the first time, I mean, you know, we, we uh, confirmed that tigers still exist in Dampa Tiger Reserve in, in 2012. So we basically, you know, uh, studied, uh, we basically surveyed Dumpa Tiger Reserve and tried to find out uh, all the carnivorous cats and through um, you know, species identification, individual identification found that Dumpa has at least minimum of three tigers. So those kind of things uh, uh, can be done. And then uh, we, uh, in 2012, uh, based on DNA fingerprinting of rhino dung samples, we basically conducted uh, genetic sen for census of uh, rhinos uh, in Gorumara uh, National Park of West Bengal and identified 43 individual rhinos. This was actually the first ever successful genetic census of rhinos in the world. All these uh, publications are available. Um, you can visit our website. Uh, you can uh, write to me if you want to have a copy of these uh, publications. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share publications and further details. Now, uh, there are certain other things also we did that we, we know that in case of rhinos, uh, some of the populations have smaller population size, some of the protected areas, and there is a possibility of loss of connectivity in rhinos uh, across, uh, you know, different population. So this may lead to reduction in gene flow among population, which may lead to, again, genetic reduction of genetic diversity and population subdivisions, as we call population structuring. So prior to uh, we started our study in 2009, no uh, information of connectivity was available. Sir, we have five minutes left. Yes, yes, I can see. Thanks. Sure. So uh, we studied uh, the rhino populations uh, uh, across Eastern India, except for Manas National Park, which is a recently reintroduced population. We studied, uh, you know, uh, two. Um, uh, protected areas in uh, West Bengal, Jaldapara and Gorumara, and three protected areas in Assam, which is Kaziranga, uh, Orang, and Pobitara. And basically, we looked at uh, the contemporary level of genetic diversity. We looked at their population structure and how genetic exchange uh, is occurring across different rhino breeding protected areas. And I also looked at, you know, uh, 
you know, whether there is inbreeding or other founder effects occurring. So that, you know, we know of the traits to these populations. So we, we basically uh, determine the genetic diversity. Now these are some of the measures of genetic diversity as I was mentioning, the allele richness, as you can see, the Assam populations has a greater amount of genetic diversity compared to the West Bengal populations. So it, it's another parameter called heterozygosity. It also shows that uh, basically uh, the West Bengal population has, uh, you know, you know, basically lower genetic diversity compared to uh, uh, Assam populations. So this was this was an interesting finding for us, and and this this is this is this is basically a graph. And what does mixing of colors say is that how much one population is genetically admixed with another. It also denotes how much how much of genetic gene flow is occurring between populations as simply as that. So you can see the Jaldapara and Golumara populations, they are far less admixed compared to populations in Assam. Now this can this this states that Jaldapara and Golumara basically are kind of isolated from populations compared to the fact that contemporary genetic exchange is still occurring between the rhino populations of Assam, probably uh, due to river islands of Brahmaputra and there are certain probably other corridors that exist. So this was an important finding and we basically uh, reported this and recommended undertaking, you know, restocking of West Bengal populations in order to maintain long-term genetic viability of these populations. And also, of course, to create alternate habitats. So these, these were already uh, published and recommended. And actually, uh, some of them are well accepted. Uh, now, there are limitations of uh, you know, uh, genetic studies. It's about, first, the limitation is that uh, there's a lack of general understanding on the scopes of genetic studies. Uh, it requires certain sort of expertise and sophisticated facility to genetic studies. And of course, establishment cost of such uh, facilities and starting a particular study is relatively quite high compared to field-based ecological studies. And again, initial protocol standardization takes time as well as a lot of resources. And it's also not very suitable for real-time monitoring of populations like other techniques like camera tripping and all can help because genetic analysis takes time. So, but then uh, these are again very robust as well. Uh, again, now there are certain limitations like white relatedness among individuals, like who is whose father, who is whose mother can be traced. Basically, a structure information. So we cannot determine A's with the current technology available in hand. We cannot determine A's of animals through genetics. So we cannot determine a structure of you know uh, individuals in a population. So those are, these are some of the limitations. But then there are there is scientific robustness. There's reproducibility of data. There is uh, this no possibility of non-invasive sampling. And then it also has certain other powers which makes it uh, you know, much more uh, useful for uh, you know, deriving robust scientific data. Now we have less than one minute, so probably I won't be able to answer questions, but uh, if you have uh, dropped your questions in the chat room, I'll get it from the host and I'll answer them through email. Thank you.